Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be talking about the wonderful epic series From. We are joined today by cast members Harold Perino, Catalina Sandino Marino, and Ian Bailey. And Harold, starting with you, I was interested in how you kind of worked with the scripts and really built the worldview of your character because you're in the unique situation that your character has been there for a really extensive amount of time. There's a lot of aspects that he's figured out about how these creatures operate, what's safe to do, what's not safe to do. Um, and so it wasn't just a case of, you know, coming in fresh and responding to the situation, but really kind of understanding and knowing the world. Um, but I imagine also doing so without all of the scripts and without all of those details. And so how did you kind of set about figuring out in the time that he's been there, what was his knowledge base? What was his worldview? And what was the psychological space that that puts him into? Wow. That's a really, really great question. And, uh, uh, and so, and, and it's really, uh, yeah, that's a really, really, really great question. So a lot of it is just like, you know, uh, uh, putting pieces together that are first and foremost pieces like the actor has to bring up himself. If I were in this situation, what would I do as a dad, as a husband, it, those things, we bring those parts of it together. And then considering that, you know, their military family and what those things are. Um, I asked a few questions to the writers about some, about some things. And then from that point, I started using my imagination and like making up things about, about things that might have done before, ways that he might have uh, gotten here before, because I didn't know the whole story of how they got there. I didn't know it until until I actually read the script. Like, oh, this is what happened between you know these characters and that character, and myself, and all that stuff. And so a lot of it was like sort of imagination. Like, if if I were tasked with you know having to take control of of this thing, how would I do it? How does that line up with sort of my responsibilities? You know, since we have two parts of our, our space, one is the colony house and one is, you know, the town and they have very different like rules. How do I make myself align with these rules that are part of the town? And for me, it's kind of easy. I, I do have a big part of myself that can be very, very rigid. And I, I'm a huge rules follower. And I believe in people who follow the rules. Uh, um, uh, and so that was really easy for me to, for me to jump into, you know, and, and, and then be sort of dismissive of some of the other stuff to sort of add the tension that, that, that's required between the two worlds. And so a bit of imagination, a bit of things that I knew, and then a little bit of who I am. And I sprinkled all that together and, uh, Boyd Stevens showed up. I, I love that. And I love the creation of him as a character. And, and Catalina, with your character, we're meeting her at a space where she's already she's already processing trauma within her family with, with the loss of a child. And then obviously coming into a town like this, there's a whole new fresh kind of trauma that she's experiencing in that space. And I was really interested in how you approach the idea of trauma within the character and the different complexities, because there are very different types of, of trauma. One's much more grief ridden, one's much more fear ridden, and how you kind of came up with an amalgamation of where those two spaces would land her. I think that it's, it's more like a survival mode instead of trauma, like getting to that place is like, you know, she has enough in her baggage. She has to deal with, the death of her baby, which I don't think it's easy for anyone to deal with something like that. And the kind of like the slowly destruction of her family. I mean, like the husband and, you know, my husband is, we're, we're not connecting. It's, it's, it's the destruction of the family. So when they get to this place, instead of being another trauma to all the traumas, it's more like, she goes into survival mode and that's the way she can function. If I think if she would come into this um, world and if it was written or if I play like it was another trauma, it was impossible for her to function in the real world. On the contrary, I think she functions in this world. She tries to, you know, she goes into mama bear mode and she just tries to take care of her children and um and try to you know keep them as safe as possible and you know the relationship with the husband it starts developing throughout the season um and it you know and, and still not resolved like you end up the season with them in a high note but we actually, they haven't had a conversation what's going to happen. It's more like the, 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 
you know, the um, excitement of what's going to happen. We're going to live here. Everyone is super excited. So we left in a very high note that relationship, but they never had a conversation what's going to happen or, you know, how, how are they going to come back together? So um, I just feel that, you know, they're healing. They're trying to heal the trauma throughout the season, but at the end, you don't know what's going to happen. So that's what season two comes in and we're going to figure it out what's going to happen with them. <laughs> can't wait. And and Ian, was that kind of similar for you in into what Catalina was saying about it being less about the trauma and more about the survivalism and just that instinct that kicks in and the need to take action versus sitting in his feelings? Or how did you approach that psychological space for your character? Well, you just hit it. That's the thing. It's like the 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 trauma is the you you one must take the action. That's the survival. And the reason the way we can take that, or I can take that survival uh uh direction is because we have we have our marriage and our our union to uphold and the love we have for each other and we also have to protect and nurture our two remaining children who have expectations from us and the the to take what is the opposite of what Harold has to go through because he has so much history to build with this place we have we have none and so it, the, the job is to experience everything fresh and anew moment by moment and everything is, is, is a new experience. But with this great, enormous pain that thankfully I have not had to deal with in life, uh, a loss of a child, and I hope I never do. Uh, but that feeling must be the enormity of it. I, I would just want to break open the world. I'd rage against the stars. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine the grief. Uh, it would be beyond all measure. So I try and take on some understanding of what that is. And, and then one foot in front of the next, try and still create a path forward, navigate through this nightmare to, to save what remains, which is an entire family unit that uh, has expectations of loving and living and, and, and a life beyond this, this purgatory that we find ourselves in. Yeah. You know, and and I love that point as well. That that for your characters, Ian and Catalina, that they are experiencing everything for the first time. You know, we get to literally witness their very first night as they're being told what's happening. We get to see that that kind of journey of like denial and acceptance in a lot of ways. And how did you approach the the fear aspect that lives within these characters as well, with everything happening around them? Because it's that thing where if you if you play it to a high level all the time, and every single new piece of information is terrifying, you know, it kind of starts to ride out for the audience. So you find like the different emotional roads in really well in your performances of like how much is something affecting them how much is it sitting with them and it always feels very contextualized to everything else that's going on with their family and with their relationships with one another well that's great sounds like you do feel like we navigated it fairly well because uh, it, <laughs> it sounded like there was a compliment in that question uh, <laughs> uh and and that is that is of course the thing to to navigate how how to not remain in one uh, constant modality the entire time of terror and fear because that is frankly uninteresting and the pathos is much more there 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 are so many layers uh, uh, of complexity that are to be mined and if one is entirely uh, engaged in fear you cannot you, your your uh, what is it the id brain the uh, the reptilian brain is fully frontal and and there's no room for anything else so really incredibly important to to pull back from that and find all of the other elements that thankfully the the writers and the directors are, are uh, want us to engage with so we just have to look for where those moments are and where to settle like because the rpms i find like there's a there's a uh, sometimes you want to have the rpms revving up here but they can't always be. You've got to take them down to a resting idle position. And uh, yeah, w w they provide those moments. And I, I look for those moments to sit in them as well. And for you, Catalina, with that? Um, I think it's actually kind of nice when, you know, you see the characters, especially my character is always with the kids. You know, I have lots of scenes with both of my children. And it's actually very beautiful to see her with Jim, you know, just those intimate moments in the couple. And they're so honest and they're just, you see, you know, that they're not 
even or they're even getting closer or like they're so far away from each other and that's that's the beauty of you know switching the survival mode because you're switching to survival mode because you just want to tell your children that it's going to be okay but when those little moments happen with the scenes that i have with with ian i find that there's some honesty in those scenes that she cannot you know, of course, she cannot say that to the children. She cannot just open her heart as she is with, with, with her husband. And I think those those little moments are are very beautiful. And with you, Harold, you know, kind of going back again to that idea that he's experienced some of this before. I feel like there's a real calibration in terms of what is it that still really scares him? Because obviously, there are things that do, and there's things that he's almost just kind of become accustomed to and, and used to because that is just part of that survivalism over the course of several years. But, you know, then an instance where he's kind of going into the woods towards the end of the season with Sarah, that's very different because that's completely new and uncharted territory. Um, and so how would you look at the scripts in various scenes and kind of figure out, is this something that he's gone through several times before? So what's his response going to be versus the newer moments? Yeah, I mean, th that's the thing that's really uh, luck that we're all really lucky about that we have these scripts that come in and they offer you all these different, uh, they offer you all these different moments that, that it, inherently in the writing, you, 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 won't, you won't land on the same note every time. Like if every scene we, we found, like he's screaming about the thing and then he's screaming about like, we don't have that. We have lots of very nuanced and interesting moments. And so it really is then about navigating, at least for, for me, you know, the, the trauma that Boyd's lived with as, as, a, as a military person already, the kind of understanding that you have about uh, moments that are traumatic or that feel uh, that feel um, uh, scary and exciting. And that exciting exciting is probably how a military person would. For me, I'd be I'd be frightened to death. But a military person may live in some of those traumatic moments. They they just know how to navigate them. So those things are really really interesting to sort of figure out, and then to figure out what the personal moments are because those are the scariest moments, right? Those are the things that no matter what you do when you notice your son might be in peril, in danger, like your heart is just going to start racing or your friend is maybe dying in your arms. There's, there's no, like you, you don't get used to that in any, at least I can't imagine that you do. And then that kind of person is a really interesting person, but that's not Boyd. And so finding all of those different little things. And because, um, you know, one of the things I think that Boyd has learned at least through the season and maybe he knew before is, 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 is that there's a human element and, and, and he's able to be a little bit forgiving, especially in terms of like when he goes into the woods with Sarah, you know, like he's got an idea about her. He's really solid. He's sure that he's going to shoot her if she does the wrong thing, but then has to realize, oh, right. This is that, this is that little girl. This is that, the kid who was working in the thing and she's probably just scared and and this place really changes you. And so for him to have all those realizations are really, are really interesting, but, but again, maybe really scary because he has to be vulnerable in a way that he's not used to being a military person. So they're a lot of fun. All those notes are really interesting notes to, to hit. You know what I mean? It's like playing jazz. They're all kind of divergent and interesting. And so, uh, but, but we have the, you know, we have the sheet music and we can follow it and it's really lovely. Yeah. And, and with all those different notes that you get to hit as well as an extension of that, I do love that the show does allow for lightness as well. It's not entirely claustrophobic throughout, you know, with what you were saying, Catalina, about those moments in the relationship and getting to have that kind of, and how that's a great juxtaposition to see where the motivation comes from. And, you know, obviously with that idea that during daylight, things feel a little bit safer, but nothing ever feels completely safe because the moment the sun goes down in a few hours, everything's going to start all over again. Um, how do you kind of figure out how much of a breath you want to allow these characters to take in the daylight and in those moments in between to bring that lightness in amongst all the heaviness of nightfall. I think the musicality is written. It's, it's, it, it's, I mean, when writing is at its best, it's written like a symphony and you, you know where the notes are and you know where the moment is where there's no other music, no other notes being played. And if, we're paying attention, it's there, it's seen, and the director knows because the director's the conductor and he's conducting it, and or she. Uh, and 
we are playing all together and it becomes apparent when we're all working together on that in that you know when we're all playing together it becomes very crystal clear when those moments are to me and i think it's interesting to have you know as an actor too to remind yourself that you're not you're not in this safe you know safe place and you're just you know i i i don't know i feel that it's it's the perfect combination between just being very you know aware of this is not my place especially i think it's easier for for well for a for a family that just came into this town sometimes you just forget that you're in this town because you're so comfortable especially like the end of those uh, episodes but it's also your job to just realize re remind yourself okay so you know we just have to balance those moments of like complete fear and complete uh this is not my place i shouldn't be here i want to get out and those moments of like you know we have to make it work so it's 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 always it's always that balance you know and and harold in in talking about boyd a little bit as well obviously later in the season we got a lot more detail about his backstory with his family with his wife and his son and you know that kind of gave us a lot of insight into him as a character was that information that you had early on even when you didn't have the scripts yet for that and then also what was it what was your approach in going into that particular scene where you had to shoot the moment where he pulls the white the, the gun on his wife because it it really captured that instance of it was just an instinct it was he didn't even have time to think and process and and really was something just calling on his military background but just that immediate protectiveness for his son and I thought it was such a great scene and such a great moment yeah it's a, it's it was a really interesting scene to shoot and 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 uh and to deal with so i didn't i didn't know from the beginning that uh, that boyd killed his wife i knew that so that's the sadness that i tried to layer into boyd and the performance of boyd throughout you know the first few episodes and um and uh going into actually shooting the scene we actually what I found really, really interesting is that there was a lot of talk about like, oh, he just pulled from the hip and it just happened and he did this thing and he just shot her because originally she was going to shoot uh, Donna. And, and, and we had a lot of conversation on that day about this idea that Boyd runs into the town and she's indiscriminately shooting people. And, 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 and if his military, you know, if his military reflexiveness was going to happen. It would have happened earlier. He was shot her and said, hey, you can't kill people. But it didn't because it's his wife, right? And, and, we, and we sort of fought for the idea that it has to be she aims at his son, where his reflexes suddenly kicking in a way that even he wasn't expecting. Because if she's going to shoot Donna, what does Boyd care? She just shot seven other people. Like, like so what? But, but it is the threat. Like I was saying, that's the thing that, that I think about Boyd. It's like, the military thing, like it's it's terrible. You can watch people getting shot, but when it's your son, it suddenly it reverberates in a really different, a different way, and your and, and your survival instincts kick in in a different way. And so then, yeah, it really does become really reflexive, even if it's your wife. Do you know what I mean? And so it was really interesting to talk about those things. And like I said, I knew that he did it, but why he did it, we had to actually work out in the moment because we had to find a, a reason for this person to actually shoot the woman that he loves like and, and it couldn't be over donna and, and and i think donna's wonderful like she's a wonderful character but it it couldn't be over her his son is really different and i thought that was really inter an interesting story to tell and really interesting drama to watch and so that made it really fun and compelling for me to do even though it took a little convincing <laughs> No, it's so interesting that, that that was the original detail was going to be very different because that would have changed the, the whole scene and the whole intention of it. You're so right. Um, yeah. You know, and coming back to you, Catalina and Ian, with, with the relationship between your characters, I mean, essentially when they come into the show and they land in this town, it's this very fractured relationship that may not even make it. And then by the end, it feels like everything that they've gone through and experienced so far in this town has really driven them closer to each other. And they've really kind of regained a lot of that intimacy that they were struggling with beforehand. Um, and I love the way that every single episode by episode, you're kind of just like very gradually building into those spaces more and more with one another and was interested in hearing a little bit about how you worked together to really do that. 
ultimately knowing the end goal of the season is, is to end up in this space and finding the journey of how you wanted to get there with their narrative arc. Catalina? Uh, um, they, they didn't tell us. I mean, like, they didn't tell me how they wanted this relationship to go. Um, actually, they didn't tell me much. They told me you, you, this couple lost a child. It was very traumatic, and they're in the process of separation. And then you see throughout the scripts how, how they get closer together, uh, which was, you know, this thing that I was saying before, those little moments when they're alone. And I think that those are the moments that are making them, you know, go back together. Um, so I don't, I mean, did I respond to your question? I think that was yeah, your question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll add to that and say that in the, in the not knowing, I, in, in life and in art, uh, am working on uh, the questioning all assumptions and looking at the things that I, that I think I know and instead standing on the edge of the abyss in some form of humility that I'm still working on and just not know and be confronted with that. And in our relationship, uh, recognize that there are so many wonders about my partner that are still to be discovered. And there is so much grief and heartache that perhaps I can be a part of healing and then recognize that that can be healed in, in, in myself. And I'm really excited about moving into the second season to, to deepen and further that and explore that love and the unknown. Uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled. If that happens. <laughs> if that happens. If, if that, if that's they the thing, you. that's the unknown. They'll know. Right? <laughs> that's the scary bit. <laughs> And with all of you as well, I was interested in hearing a little bit more about the dynamic of, of working alongside the rest of the cast. And there's so many really great moments to have a lot of ensemble scenes with a lot of the rest of the cast. And it sounds like a lot of you spent time outside of production, outside of filming when you were living up there to shoot, you know, spending time on your own, going over scenes, kind of rehearsing things on your own, talking about character. Um, and, and I was interested in kind of that aspect of, of really, you know, when production moves very fast, finding that those moments to really seek out your own time and, and what you feel really came into your characters and came into the show from that sort of collaboration. And also just the fact that then you were able to build closer relationships off screen to do what you do together on screen and have more of a shorthand as well. Well, it, it was it was really interesting because we actually did get to do a number of things together, things that you know we might not have normally done, and uh, and uh, and with these uh, brilliant actors here, uh, I, it's interesting because we've all been around a little bit. It was kind of like cool, like I knew that they could do their thing, but we have a, we have a bunch of younger actors. Uh, that that were like, hey, you want to go and you want to rehearse, and it, it reminded me of when when I was a younger actor, and 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 instead of being cynical about it, which I, you could be, I was just like, okay, let's let's go and rehearse, and it was really wonderful to revisit that kind of that early like, yes, we don't have to wait to be on set, we can get here and we can rehearse it and come up with things, and then we get on set, it's going to change again, um, and so. It was nice and it was a, we were able to really build a community out of that and bring that community uh, onto the screen uh, and in, in, in a way that, that, that the characters actually look connected, even though they've just met, you know, some of them, have just, I've just met these, 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 this family. And, but, you know, I have more of a relationship with my sheriff and with the nurse and you know what I mean? And so it was, it was, it was really an interesting kind of time to do that amidst what we talked about a little earlier, like this COVID time where, you know, we get to talk to the other actors, but we literally don't know what anybody else looks like for the, in, you know, the entire crew. Like we're working with a bunch of anonymous people. <laughs> and so again, it makes us sort of like group in even, even tighter as, a, as an acting unit, as a, 
as a, you know, like this, you know, sort of traveling band of storytellers. And so that's what I thought about it. And part of that, part of that rehearsal process is, is, is the spent spending time together in different circumstances. I mean, we had rock climbing experiences, water slide parks into lakes, going out on a sailboat in the, in, in the ocean. Um, yeah. And, and then, you know, games on set with full ball. And uh, I'll tell you what, Catalina, this lady, she is uh, what the, the game of bop it. She <laughs> is the reigning champion. She can just. <laughs> My eyes. Closed. Bop it. Flip it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got Simon. Simon says that game. Uh, I think I was going to call Simon for, for mm-hmm. our young castmate Simon. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of fun to be had, and that builds, like Harold was indicating, the, the sense of community that we all. You know, I mean, you have to do it, right? It's like being in the circus. You go and you meet up with the people, and you don't know them, and relationships have to be coalesced in some sense, really rapidly sometimes. And, yeah. uh, and, and that's a skill in itself, like how to, how to do, do that and build rapport. And, and these, these, these two are really good at it. Yeah. And one of the things that I really love in watching this show is that it feels like the moments between the dialogue are just as important as the words that the characters say. And it really allows your performances to take the time in scenes. You know, if there's a moment of your character observing something, taking something in silently, you know, a lot of subtext to, to a particular scene, that, that time in that space is there. And so the lines really count when they're said out loud as well. Um, and it also sounds like there's a lot of great exposition and detail in the scripts. What, what are some of the ways in which the scripts gave you a lot of that exposition and detail for a lot of those scenes where there isn't as much dialogue to lean into with your characters in terms of what they're saying? Okay. I'm thinking. Um... The directors, uh and namely the director who kind of is the overseeing uh, uh, Jack, uh, of, of the whole show, Jack Bender, he made it clear, and I think without even saying it, just by doing it early on, that scenes where there is not a, a dialogue necessarily, it's still a scene and it is going to exist and it is going to breathe and there are going to be things that transpire. And he and the and in in his leadership with the other directors made sure that he allows the space for those things to happen. So it could be uh, you know one one eighth of a page can be an entire experience. And I learned that pretty quickly not to take anything too lightly, like oh I don't have much dialogue today or something like that, because everything can ask a lot of you in the show and to be to be mm-hmm. prepared for that. Mm-hmm. Okay, I remember. Mm-hmm. Now that Ian was talking, I and I totally agree with what you say. Actually, it was Jack at the first, I can't remember, it was the first episode or second episode where we, second episode, where Donna is telling me her whole story about, you know, the, her life and how she got there and, you know, just. How her sister was killed. How, yes, that, that story. I remember, you know, I don't have anything to say. I'm just going to sit there and listen. That's going to be okay. That's, that's easy. And then it was not easy because whatever I was reacting to what she was saying. And then Jack was like, do you, I mean, like, just think about her sister. Like he makes sure. And I think in, in the, in the episode, you just see that there's a lot of time me reacting to what she was saying. And I didn't understand why I have to be on camera. She's the one that's telling the story. It doesn't make sense. But it makes total sense because that's real life. In a conversation, if I'm telling you something, you will react to what I have to say. And that's just the the organic thing to do. And I feel that thanks to that moment and probably a few more that I just can't remember, it makes the character be more organic. It makes the scenes way more organic. If something feels off, either I catch it or the director will come and be like, hmm, let's just go back a little bit. And, you know, and by organic, I mean like those moments where there's no dialogue and you just have to be there and and just be. And and I appreciate that so much from, from, you know, Jack and all the other directors that let us just be. (laughs) And that's something that sometimes it doesn't happen in TV, especially because they go so fast. 
they just want to cut things and okay action and horror and you know the monster this 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 show is letting people just actually react and actually just be that they yeah. care they care about listening yeah it's important in this show yeah. listening yeah. i was gonna i was gonna I piggyback know. and saying like jack actually thing like you know, one of the things that that uh, comes up for me a lot when you, when you guys are talking about this, and uh, it's it's the choosing ceremony, and 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 it's the choosing ceremony helps me to realize that there's an audience, and it's because of the Matthews family that I re because in the very beginning of the choosing ceremony, you guys have nothing to say. You're just watching this whole thing, and that's exactly what the audience is doing. They're just watching all this stuff play out and then suddenly you have to make this decision but it's the watching that brings us into it it's the watching and the listening and the watching the matthews family watch and listen and that's and that's jack and that's you guys and that, that silence is so is so important so important captivating the audience because theoretically if the, the audience is just listening just like you are they're just taking in the information and then you know, like when Katish freaks out and says, whoa, hey, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to my daughter. Everybody's like, hell yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. they've been listening as well. And they have a now a stake in it. And so and so Jack is really great at it. And, and these guys, again, just listening was fantastic. It was beautiful to watch. Yeah. Well, I really, really love everything that you brought to your performances in the first season. I'm so excited that you're going back into production again soon for another season of... Who even knows what will happen in season two? No way to guess. Um, but thank you so much for talking all about this. Really appreciate all of your time today. Thank you, Mara. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah.